three Albuquerque, New Mexico sleep experts, Dr. Barry Craco from Sleep and Human Health Institute, Maimonides Sleep Arts and Sciences, and Los Alamos Medical Center, and sleep technologists Victor Uliberry and Natalia McIver discuss their article appearing in an upcoming issue of Mayo Clinic Proceedings entitled Pharmacotherapy Failure in a Large Cohort of Chronic Insomnia Patients Presenting to a Sleep Medical Center and Laboratory. Subjective Pretest Predictions and Objective Diagnoses. Out of 1,200 chronic insomnia patients that came to our sleep center, 900 of them were using sleep aids, and every single one of them was failing pharmacotherapy. We're so used to believing that insomnia is a psychological condition, but in these patients who failed drugs, nearly all of them had a physical condition, obstructive sleep apnea. Virtually all of the insomnia patients had never connected their difficulties to having a sleep breathing problem. 91% of these insomnia patients had sleep apnea. Whether or not this is a radical paradigm shift, what we found is quite striking. Insomnia patients who fail their drugs really have sleep apnea. So how did we get here? Well, we weren't the first to look at the relationship between insomnia and sleep disorder breathing. In 1973, Dr. Gimeno, a seminal figure in the history of sleep medicine, actually connected insomnia and sleep apnea. In 2001, we observed that many treatment-seeking trauma survivors with sleep complaints reported frequent insomnia and breathing symptoms. That same year, we used an advanced respiratory sensor for the first time to test chronic insomnia patients. The sensor itself looks like a cannula. It actually measures breathing events quite accurately. We found that 40 of 44 patients were diagnosed with a sleep breathing disorder. In 2010, in two different samples consisting of treatment-resistant hypnotic-dependent insomnia patients, we diagnosed sleep breathing disorders in 90% of the 355 patients. In 2012, we asked 20 chronic insomniacs what woke them up in the middle of the night, and not one of them offered sleep breathing as a problem. Not one of them. But yet, 90% of awakenings in the lab were preceded by a sleep breathing event. And finally, Last year, of 1,000 patients we surveyed in the waiting room of their primary care doctor, 50% reported co-occurring SDB and insomnia symptoms. In fact, insomnia severity was strongly associated with a number of sleep breathing symptoms. If the rate of pharmacotherapy failure is 100% in a sleep center, what's the rate in a primary care clinic? Uh, the answer is that it's probably pretty high, and that means that doctors are either getting confused or challenged in some way where they're not able to sort out which of their patients may need a sleep study. Making matters worse is that there is no formal definition of pharmacotherapy failure. So that puts primary care physicians and psychiatrists at a distinct disadvantage because they have not been trained or may not have the experience to recognize when sleep aids and related sedating medications are not working. So now the question becomes, what would prompt the primary care doctor to approach these patients differently. It seems to us insomnia patients are so focused on their lack of sleep, they tend to steer doctors away from any discussion of breathing symptoms. By redirecting patient awareness to a different set of symptoms, we can show them how sleep breathing is important. Dry mouth is a reliable symptom of mouth breathing and an indicator of obstructed sleep breathing. Morning headaches are another reliable symptom. CO2 buildup in the brain from sleep apnea leads to vasodilation of cerebral arteries and the feeling of headache or a band around the forehead. Nocturia is also a reliable symptom of sleep disorder breathing. Nocturia is often caused by sleep apnea. How does that happen? Well, with the obstruction of the upper airway, there is increasingly negative intrathoracic pressure, which puts pressure on the venous system to actually produce a greater flow of blood into the right atrium. The right atrium distends and experiences a false fluid overload. As a result, it releases atrial natriuretic peptide, the body's natural diuretic that goes to the kidneys, which then produces more urine, and then depending upon the patient's bladder sensitivity, they will wake up at night to use the bathroom. Remarkably, when someone is treated with PAP therapy, it's very common that all trips to the bathroom are completely eliminated. Sleep breathing symptoms all occur while sleeping. 
but primary care doctors might find waking symptoms like dry mouth, morning headache, nocturia, much more reliable in raising suspicion of sleep apnea in their insomnia patients. So what are the treatment ramifications? Treating obstructive sleep apnea helps to reduce awakenings and allows the patient to sleep through the night. In 2008, Guimano showed surgical treatment of obstructive sleep apnea for insomnia patients had an immediate impact on reducing sleep maintenance insomnia and also improved patient sleep, breathing, and daytime symptoms of sleepiness and fatigue. At the annual sleep conference, our poster presentation showed marked changes in insomnia when patients use highly advanced forms of CPAP therapy, known as auto bilevel or ASV, adaptive servo ventilation. Regular users average six hours per night with ABPAP or ASV and experience nearly a 50% decrease in insomnia severity in association with their use of advanced PAP devices. Despite using only between one and a half to two hours a night, partial users still showed improvement in insomnia severity. It turns out insomnia has a differential diagnosis. And while there are cases where psychological factors predominate, now we're beginning to see that physiological factors, particularly sleep apnea, are a major contributor to this problem. This raises the question of what's going on in primary care clinics. How, in fact, are they evaluating these patients? And our concern is that the insomnia patient themselves, they are walking in the door and steering that doctor towards the medication approach just as much as a primary care doctor might be steering the insomnia patient towards the medication approach. This may be happening because the insomnia patient is talking about symptoms that occur while they're awake. They can't sleep. They can't fall asleep. They can't stay asleep. Whereas sleep disordered breathing is something that occurs while you are asleep. That seems to be a major factor in creating this confusion and the challenge for primary care doctors. I can't tell you the number of times I've heard an insomnia patient say, yes, doctor, I snore. But I didn't come to the sleep center for that problem. My problem is insomnia. What can you do to treat that? What we have learned in sleep medicine is very simple. Ambien does not treat sleep apnea. Lunesta does not treat sleep apnea. Trazodone does not treat sleep apnea. Therefore, if you want someone to get the fullest, most thorough evaluation, use that as your most important red flag. If the patient is failing medication, they often need to go to a sleep center and undergo sleep testing. We hope you found this presentation from the content of Mayo Clinic Proceedings valuable. Our journal's mission is to promote the best interests of patients by advancing the knowledge and professionalism of the physician community. If you are interested in more information about us, our homepage is www.mayocliniceproceedings.org. There you will find access information for our social media content, such as additional videos on our YouTube channel or journal updates on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter. More information about healthcare at Mayo Clinic is available at www.mayoclinic.com. This video content is copyrighted by Mayo Foundation for Medical Education and Research.